All right, as I mentioned right before I started reading in Ephesians 1, we're going to get back to Ephesians 1 in a little bit. But um, what I'm going to be preaching about today is a subject that it might affect all of us. It might affect some of us from time to time. I know I've dealt with this in the past, but the title of my sermon is Doubting Your Salvation. And I know people have, have come across this in their life. I've talked to plenty of people that, that throughout their life, at some points, they get to a point where they're starting to doubt, am I really saved? And I want to go over some of the different reasons this morning why people think that way. And then, and also to just expound and explain how, you know, salvation is by grace through faith. And that once we're saved, it's eternal life. It lasts forever. We're going to see some scriptural reasons for this and some scriptural evidence. Um, and just hopefully this will just help edify you. And if you're not having this issue right now, maybe in the future you will. Maybe something will happen. You know, people have low points that happen in their life, whether it be the loss of a loved one or whatever, and people just start questioning God and start, start questioning their own salvations. And hopefully you can think back to this sermon and to, and to these verses out of the Bible, more importantly, of what we're going to go over as to why people might think that um, they, they doubt their salvation. One of the things I've heard people say is, did I believe enough or did I believe right? The Bible says, you don't have to turn there in Acts 8.37, when Philip preached the gospel unto the Ethiopian eunuch and he asked him and he said, you know, what doth hinder me to be baptized? You know, why can't I be baptized? So Philip asked him this question. He says, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's salvation right there. He confessed Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He put his faith on, on Jesus Christ to be saved. But oftentimes what happens is, and, and, and I do this too because it's true. You know, we'll say, well, you have to believe on Christ with all of your heart. And someone might wonder, well, did I really believe in him with all of my heart? Was I holding back a little bit? Did I really put all of my trust in him? And, and you know, these types of questions get people to doubt. And it's understandable. I could get that. You start thinking about it. But what we mean by all of your heart is, are you only trusting in Jesus Christ? Does he have all of your faith? And I think one of the problems that people have is they, is they tend to put an emotional spin on it. Like, I don't know if I felt strong enough, if that was all of my heart was on Jesus Christ. In order to believe on Jesus Christ with all of our heart, all that means is that we're not trusting in anything else. So some people today will say, well, I believe on Jesus Christ to be saved, but I also have to read my Bible every day to be saved. Now, if you believe that all of your faith isn't on Christ to save you, some of it is on yourself to keep a commandment, you know, whether it be not murdering, not stealing, you know, going to church, praying, whatever it is. If you're adding any of those other things to your faith on Christ, then all of your faith isn't on Christ. You're not believing in Him with all of your heart. You're also trusting in these other works of the law. And the Bible is clear that our salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. That it's just by faith in Christ. So when it says here that we need to believe on Christ with all of our heart, if we believe on Him with all of our heart, well, that's because we're only trusting on Him. That means all of our faith, whatever faith we have, is resting on Jesus Christ. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 17, because that's the other thing that kind of goes hand in hand. Did I believe enough? Did I have enough faith to get saved? You know, when it says with all of your heart, it doesn't mean you have to have tons of faith at this, this just exceeding amount of overflowing faith. All that means is that he's the only thing you're trusting. You're not trusting yourself. You're not trusting in anything else to be saved. Matthew 17, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? They're asking why they couldn't cast out a devil. They were going about, they were doing these miracles, they were doing the will of God, and they came across this man that was possessed of a devil, and they weren't able to cast the devil out. Now, they were able to cast out other devils, but this one they weren't able to cast out. And Jesus answers them. See, Jesus was able to cast them out. And Jesus said unto them in verse 20, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, 
Ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So Jesus is telling them there. Now the disciples had faith in Christ. They were saved. Okay? But in order to, to do this great work of casting out this devil that was giving them a hard time, he said, well, it's your unbelief. You need more faith in order to do this. Now, but look at this amount of faith. Now, I don't know anyone today that has the faith to remove mountains and say, if you say this mountain, go and it's going to go. Jesus Christ said that, that, that if you have enough faith, you can do this. And I believe it with all of my heart. I don't think he was lying to them or just using a figure of speech. I think he was, he was being serious. He says, look, if you have the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you can, you can just tell this mountain to move and it'll do it. And think about how small that is. If you have the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, that's, that's pretty little. It's pretty minute. And that's to do a great work. So the amount of faith that we can gather that we're going to need to get saved, it's not that much. It's a little bit. We don't need to have an abundance of faith, but it needs whatever amount we have even if it's the speck, like a speck of a piece of salt, a grain of salt, even if that's how much faith we have, it just all has to be on Jesus Christ. He has to be the only thing that we're trusting on to save us. We're not trusting in ourselves or anything else. So we don't have to worry about, did I have enough faith? You know, is all of my heart on Christ? If he's all that you're trusting in to save you, then all of your heart is on Christ. And, and you know, people tend to, in our human minds make things more complicated than they really are and and it's not that difficult and this is hopefully you will understand with all of these things this morning that salvation is not difficult as the new perversions will say that 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 difficult is the way they're they're false that's a false version of the bible when you see that if the bible talking about salvation and it calls it difficult throw that bible in the trash because it's not the word of god Getting saved is easy. That's why we believe in easy believism. That's what we believe in because it's easy to get saved because Christ did all of the hard work. When he lived the perfect life, when he performed the miracles, when he died on the cross, when his soul went to hell and rose again after three days and three nights, he did all of the work. We don't do the work. We put our faith in Christ. That's what gets us saved. It's an easy thing for us to do, and hopefully we'll understand as we go through some of these, these, pro, these issues that people might have that, it's, that we're just usually end up making it more difficult on ourselves. So what's another thing? Um, sometimes people might say, well, I don't know if I really understood the gospel when I got saved. I don't know if I really understood it. And normally people have this type of an issue, maybe when they're young, when they get saved, they're six or five years old or seven or whatever, and they start to, they get older and they learn more about the Bible and they're like, man, I don't know if I really got saved back then because I don't know if I really understood the gospel. Now, I will say this, in order to put your faith on something, you have to know something about it, right? I mean, in order to believe, in order to believe the gospel, you have to know what the gospel is. And that's why we spend so much time at the door talking to people and explaining the gospel. And I usually bring up examples of, of um, you know, what faith is and, and what faith on Christ is. Um, when we talk to people, explain that what everlasting means. Explain what a gift means. Explain that it's free, that it's not based on our works. Explain that it lasts forever. Because if you think you could lose your salvation by committing a sin then they're not quite grasping the concept of the freeness of the gift. That, that it's not a contract of, well, I'm going to do good in order to receive this, this reward. Because that's not the way salvation works. We don't have to do good in order to earn our way into heaven. So I use examples to explain, hey, it's a free gift. You're already a sinner. You don't deserve it. So if you sin again later, it doesn't mean you're going to undeserve that gift. It was given to you for free, paid for by the blood of Christ. So we use these things, but you have to understand that. I believe it's critical to, un to have that type of an understanding that salvation is completely paid for by Christ and that it's not based on how good of a person you are. If you have any other type of belief, your belief is wrong. You're not, either you don't understand the gospel or you're not believing the gospel. Either way, you're not saved if you believe you have to do something or maintain some kind of a good life. 
we need to understand this. But what I would say that is if, if, you, if you claim maybe I didn't really understand the gospel, look, it doesn't matter the day that you got saved. What you need to ask yourself is today, do you understand it now? Is all of your faith on Christ now? Because if it is right now, then that's all that matters. It doesn't matter which day it was. Hey, man, I wasn't sure if I really got saved when I was six. Maybe I got saved when I was 10. I don't know. And you're like 30 now. Like, well, who cares? <laughs> you could have got saved when you were six. You got saved when you were 10. It doesn't matter. You're saved now. You have everlasting life. Don't let that be a hang up in your mind. Don't get to you know, dwell on those things too much because it's not gonna, it's not gonna edify you at all to, to, to wonder. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. What matters is right now, what do you believe? Is your faith on Jesus Christ? And that ties in real closely with my next point because some people, and I've heard this, where people would say, well, maybe I was already a reprobate. And reprobate means they're rejected of God. And this is a doctrine that we believe in this church. And a lot of times people hear that doctrine for the first time because it's kind of gone away. It's kind of been lost in, in mainstream Christianity. It's not a popular subject to preach on. And it hasn't been preached on appropriately. So people don't really have a, a proper concept of, of, of people who become reprobate and these false prophets and false teachers um, that are described in Jude and in 2 Peter chapter 2 and in Romans 1 and um, you know the idea that people can become reprobate and how horrible of a sin homosexuality is because it's against nature and, and Romans 1 explains that, that people have, you know, God has given them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So we hear this type of preaching and then people have questioned in the past, like, well, wait, I don't know. You know, I've done something in my past. And, and usually it's associated with alcohol. You know, someone was out and there was, you know, some girl got really, really drunk and, and you know, it was a group of guys around and they ended up kissing some girl or something. It was like, which is, which is, look, is that wicked? Yes, that's horribly wicked. It's sinful. It's wrong. It ought never to happen. But... And I'm not going to go into details on, on, well, what can you really do before you reprobate? Look, sometimes if, if, if something like that has happened, you need to analyze yourself today. Do you, is your faith on Jesus Christ? Because here's the thing. Reprobates, they're not even going to be thinking along those lines typically of, of worrying about being saved and, 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 and did I already become a reprobate? Normally, because they're already given up and given over to a reprobate mind and doing those things which are not convenient. And the Bible says that they're haters of God. But <clears throat> think about um, Paul, because Paul had a really bad past. So, so people who think they might be like, man, maybe I've been reprobated because I had a really bad past. I did a lot of wicked sins. I did a lot of evil. I did a lot of wrong in my life. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And that's one of the keys right there, is that Paul did this ignorantly in unbelief. And Romans 1 describes people who says that they knew the grace of God. They knew the Creator, but they decided to, to worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. They rejected God, therefore God rejected them. See, they knew the Gospel. They knew about Jesus Christ, but they rejected it. That's different than doing things ignorantly in, in unbelief. Paul did things ignorantly in unbelief. He, didn't, he wasn't a rejecter of Jesus Christ. Now, he persecuted the church. He did really, really, again, very wicked sins in the sight of God, but he was able to obtain mercy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. It says in verse 14, And the grace of our God was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern of them which should hereafter believe on him to, everlast to life everlasting. Now, people are worried about being reprobate. When you do things ignorantly, in unbelief, you know, you haven't just rejected God and, and you know, know the gospel but just completely rejected it. 
you can find mercy from God. And actually, again, just as with the previous examples, this should help put your mind at ease anyways. If this is something that really bothers you, if you think about, man, I've, done, I've had this really bad past and I don't know, you know, I've done things that are really bad. What do you believe right now? That is what you need to ask yourself. Is all of your faith in Christ right now? Because if it is, the Bible says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says anybody, whosoever. So if you believe on Jesus Christ right now, today, then you obviously weren't reprobate whatever it was that you've done in your past. If, if your faith is 100% in Jesus Christ today, then you are saved. Because that's what the Bible says is all we have to do to be saved. And here's the other aspect of reprobates that maybe you didn't know is that they can't believe. And we went over this last Wednesday in the Bible study in John chapter 8. We saw the, a great portion of scripture there about how, of how the, you know, the Pharisees, those that blaspheme the Holy Ghost, they could not believe. They were already reprobate. They were given over to the reprobate mind. They were rejected because they rejected Christ, because they commit the unpardonable sin. They could not believe. So if you believe on Christ today, and if you're not believing in works, and you're only believing in Him alone, you're saved, you have everlasting life. That proves, that alone proves you are not reprobate. Because reprobates can't believe it. I'm going to show you this. In, um, turn, if you would, to John chapter 12. And we'll get this to this again in a few weeks in our Bible study, but John chapter 12. I'll read from you, for you from Exodus chapter 1. Or I mean, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 10, verse 1, with Pharaoh. Now, if you remember, Pharaoh did not want to let the children of, of Israel leave the, uh, the land of Egypt. And um, Moses was performing all these miracles, and, and there was all these plagues being sent. And it starts off with Pharaoh hardening his heart. That's how he starts off, is that Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Pharaoh's like, nope. He's like, who is the Lord? I don't want to, you know, uh, you're not going to go. And, and he keeps rejecting him. And he sees these miracles. He sees what's happening, but he still hardens his own heart. But then what starts to happen, it's real interesting. You start looking at the scripture. Then all of a sudden, God starts to harden his heart. After Pharaoh decides that, that he's not going to listen, that he hardens his own heart, he hardened his heart enough to where God started hardening his heart. And in Exodus 10, verse 1, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him. If God hardens your heart, he makes it impossible. Pharaoh had no choice in that matter to just accept the, um, the children of Israel and to allow them to leave. By that point in his life. Now, earlier he had the opportunity. But at this point, when God hardens his heart, there's no way Pharaoh was going was gonna to allow those things to happen because God hardened his heart. We're in John chapter 12. Look at verse 37. This makes it a lot more clear. Pharaoh was an example of someone whose heart God had hardened. John chapter 12, look at verse 37. The Bible says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Talking about Jesus Christ. And you know, oftentimes you just wonder, man, you know, Jesus was doing all of these miracles, healing the sick and raising, you know, how could the people not believe on him seeing these things happening right in front of their faces? Hearing what he's saying, hearing the word of God. He's preaching the scripture. He's healing people. He's doing all this stuff. They see miracles that no man can do. How do they not believe on him? Let's keep reading. Verse 38 says that the saying of Isaiah, that's his Isaiah the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. You see that? They could not believe. It's not possible for them to believe. Because as Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. Harden their heart, just like he did to Pharaoh. That they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. It's because they were already reprobate, and God had hardened 
their heart so that they could not believe. It's impossible for someone. Once someone has been completely rejected by God and has gone reprobate, they cannot believe because believing would give them everlasting life and they'd be saved. And God makes it so that they cannot believe. And that's what the scripture says right here. Also backed up in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, talking about false prophets, says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. No matter how much they try, no matter how much they study, he says they, they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Those that are reprobate cannot believe. So if you're worried about your past, if you're worried about the things that you've done and say, I don't know, I might be a reprobate already. Is your faith on Jesus Christ alone? Because if, if you believe on him with all of your heart, if you believe on him that, that, that he came and paid for your sins and it's by grace through faith alone, it's not of works as any man shows. If you believe that, then you're not a reprobate. Because you're saved, because that's what it takes to be saved. And you wouldn't even be able to believe that if you were a reprobate. There's no way you'd be able to believe that because your heart would be hardened and you would resist the truth. So hopefully that will help you understand. And look, we don't know all of the details and ins and outs of exactly when, you know, how close a person can get to being reprobate before they're actually just completely rejected. We don't know exactly the moment that that happens in a person. And you can have some very, a lot of wickedness in your life. But as, as Paul did, he did it ignorantly in unbelief. And he obtained mercy. And Jesus Christ died for all the sins of the world. And, and like I said, if you, if you have that faith, if you today have that faith, don't worry about what you've done in your past anymore. It's done and it's over. You can know that you have salvation today because it w if you were reprobate, it wouldn't even be possible for you to have that faith. Let's move on to our next point here. And that's what the Bible, we read this last week in John chapter 8, verse 36. The Bible says, if the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. If you have your faith in Christ, if He makes you free, hey, you're free indeed. You are saved for sure if you've received that free gift. Now, another reason why some people doubt or question their salvation is because they've been influenced by false teachings. They've allowed a, a, a false heretical doctrine to, to infiltrate their mind and to get them to start wondering and doubting, oh man, am I really saved? Like, um, you know, someone might put their faith completely in, in, in Christ and get saved, but then a family member, like shortly after that, brings them into another church. And then they start hearing this other stuff, so then they start questioning. And a lot of times people might think, well, I didn't really have an emotional experience. You know, because they'll hear all these other people saying, oh, this big wave rushed over me, and I felt this big calm, and I saw this light. And they have these great, and look, if someone had an experience like that, praise God, you know, whatever. I'm not just downing on some other people's experience, but what I'm saying is that don't put so much stock in an emotional experience because a lot of people have emotional experiences. Mormons claim they have emotional experiences. Lots of people of all different types of false religions and cults and false denominations have emotional experiences. That doesn't make you saved. And don't start thinking that just because you didn't have a certain emotional experience that, well, maybe I'm not saved now. Because your salvation comes based on what you believe. It's based on your faith. Is your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ? Hey, you don't have to have some warm sensation come over you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That is not a requirement. It's not a necessity. So if people start you know, telling you, oh, well, you know, don't worry about, about what other people's emotional experiences might, may or may not have been. That is not going to have any influence or impact on whether or not you're saved. And other people get, get caught up in you know, the false religions of Pentecostal churches. Well, they'll say that, well, if you're saved, you'll speak in tongues. And there's, uh, there's, there's definitely, they're out there that'll say that, that if you don't show this sign of speaking in tongues, then you're really not saved. And I spoke with one of my friends that went to my other church. He grew up with this. 
And, and he would say, man, you know, I, I, I really wanted to do this. And, and it troubled him. And he was already saved. He got saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But then he was going to this other church that was teaching this. Mm -hmm. and, and he said he kept wondering, like he wanted to do it. He wanted to fit it. And he, he, he wanted to, to show this, but he couldn't do it. And, and it really made him start to doubt himself and doubt his own salvation. And, and unfortunately, that's what happens because they get caught up in a false doctrine. They don't know, they probably don't know the Bible very well for themselves. If they did, you know, you wouldn't be deceived by this. But, but they get caught up and, you know, maybe they have a lot of relatives, family and friends and they're all, they're all going to this church and they're all doing this. So it influences the way you think and you start to doubt your own salvation. But again, salvation doesn't change. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. The Bible says, Lord, you know, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. It doesn't say speak in tongues and thou shalt be saved. It says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you've done that, you're saved. You don't need to worry about that and let that influence you to doubt your salvation. Another false doctrine that people will tend to get confused about because it's taught so widely, is that people say, well, you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. And this is something that people parrot and will say because they've heard it over and over and over again. And the problem with that is that people start hearing, oh, do you have to repent of your sins to be saved? Repent of your sins to be saved. Repent of your sins to be saved. And then a Christian goes out and commits a sin, and then they're thinking, wait, I have to repent of my sins to be saved, and I just commit a sin. And they start doubting their salvation. And the Bible says in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Not committing sins... Obeying God's law is righteousness that we do. That's the righteousness which we have done. And that's why Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. We're saved by His mercy. He gives us a free gift. It's not us giving up our sinful life. And this doctrine makes me so angry because... It doesn't make any sense. People will say, the same people that claim you have to repent of your sins and be saved, they're all sinners. So do you think that they turn from all of their sins? If you're still sinning, you haven't turned from all of your sins. That's what the word means. If you're going to take these words literally and just, instead of just throwing around words because you want to make yourself look better than somebody else because you think, oh, I'm so righteous and I'm so holy. I've repented of my sins. That person hasn't. Right. You fool. You are a sinner just as much as they are. God is only going to allow you to have grace if your faith is on Him. It has nothing to do with your obedience to His law. That is not a requirement for being saved. Oh, you have to repent of your sins. You have to repent of your sins. If you truly turn from all of your sins, that would mean that you don't sin anymore. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So if you truly think that you've turned from all of your sins and you don't, live a sin, you, you don't sin anymore, the truth's not in you. You're tricking yourself. You're deceiving your own self. That's what the Bible says. And turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 19. Because I want you to see this. Acts chapter 19. This is an answer that you could give someone who tries to tell you, oh, well, what about repentance? Because because I believe that we don't have to, to, to stop sinning and turn from all of our sins to be saved, people say, oh, well, you don't, you don't believe in repentance then. You don't teach repentance. Yes, I do believe in repentance. I believe in a scriptural definition of repentance, and I believe in using the context of the Bible to determine what repentance is even talking about, because when we have God repenting of some things, well, it's not talking about sin there, is it? Because God's not a sinner. God doesn't have to turn from sin. In other places, repenting is talking about sins. 
But it's not talking about giving up sins to be saved. It's talking about as Christians, we need to repent daily. We have to die to self daily. We have a spiritual battle going on. We have the flesh and we have the spirit. Every single day we have to choose. Are we going to walk in the flesh or are we going to walk in the spirit? Hey, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They're at enmity with each other. It's a battle. We have to repent of the, of the wickedness that we do in our lives. We have to try to change that. But it's not to be saved and go to heaven. It's to be right with God. It's to be an obedient child of God. It is not to be saved. People will say, oh, well, well, Jesus preached repentance and John preached repentance. Yes, they did. Now, if I believed in a false religion, if I believed in Mormonism, if I believed in Catholicism, if I believed in these works-based salvations to be saved, I would have to change my belief. I would have to turn from that belief to believe the true gospel. And that's why you'll find anytime it's taught, when repentance is used with salvation, it's repent and believe the gospel. Because you're changing your belief system from believing on a false religion to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That repentance is necessary for salvation because it has to do with your belief. Because in order to be saved, it's based on your belief. And when people try to tell you, oh, well, John preached repentance. Turn to Acts 19.4. We're in Acts 19. Show them this verse because Acts 19.4 explains exactly what John was preaching when he preached repentance. Verse 4 says, Then said Paul, John verily, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people. This is what he said when he preached the baptism of repentance. What did John say? Saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. Does that say anything about giving up their sins and going to church and living a righteous life? Nope. That's not the repentance that he taught. The repentance that he taught was that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is what the Bible teaches that we need to do to be saved. It's not giving up an ungodly life. Now, should we give up an ungodly life? Of course we should. That's why Romans 6 says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Of course we shouldn't continue in sin. But that, that living a righteous life is not going to cut it. It's not going to get you saved. It's not going to get you to heaven. We need to separate, be able to separate the, the, the requirement for being saved, which is just faith, from what we ought to do. What should we do with our lives? We should follow God. Hey, we should be perfect. That's what we should do. But if we're not, that doesn't mean we're not saved. And what people get confused about is when they hear this repeated over and over, you repent of your sins, you repent of your sins. Well, when you start to sin, it's only, it's only common sense to start thinking, well, if I'm sinning, I didn't repent of my sins. And oftentimes, people have sins that they struggle with in their life because it's not always easy to get sin out of your life. And you'll have somebody in and, and, and these churches that, that like to, to be real proud and, and have their nose lifted up in the air. They'll pick certain sins and they'll demonize them more than others. And then they'll say, oh, well, if you're doing this sin, then you're not saved because you didn't repent of your sins. But they never want to talk about the sins that they're doing. <laughs> they never want to bring that up. And anybody who's had a battle with addiction, whether it be drugs or alcohol, knows that it's not easy to get out of that bondage. And just because a person is struggling with that, and sometimes they backslide and they might fall back into that sin, hey, that doesn't make it okay. But it doesn't mean that that person's not saved either. Because they're having a hard time working on their life. If their faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, they are saved. If they go back to the bottle at some point after quitting, they didn't repent of that because they're back doing it again. But it doesn't mean they're not saved. And so many people, I believe this is one of the biggest things that, that can lead people to doubt their salvations because they're so worried about, you know, if they don't do what's right, then they weren't really saved. And that is not what the Bible teaches. If that were true, then our flesh would have to be changed the moment we get saved. Because our flesh has this sinful nature abiding in it, which is what leads us into sin anyways. The bottom line is if you're looking at your sins and questioning your salvation, 
then what are you trusting to go to heaven? If you're looking at your sins and say, well, I have a sinful life, are you trusting your obedience to God's laws to be saved? If you're looking at a sinful life and saying, well, I don't know if I'm, if I'm going to make it to heaven because I've got this sin in my life, is your faith in the law? Because if it is, you're not saved. Then you ought to doubt your salvation. If you're worried about, about not obeying the law to, to go to heaven, then you're not saved and you ought to be worried. But if your faith is in Jesus Christ, hey, he paid for those sins. He paid for every single one of them. That doesn't mean just go out and do them, but still, you're saved. You've received salvation. Another uh, false teaching out there that, that leads people to doubt their salvation is they'll think, did I give my life to Jesus? I hear this all the time. People say, well, I gave my life to Jesus. That's why I'm saved. And, you know, with both of these, with repenting of your sins and with this phrase, you know, giving your life to Jesus, there are a lot of people out there that are truly saved that use these, this terminology and it's just because they hear it repeated all the time but when you actually ask them about it, they don't really believe what they're saying. They don't within their heart believe, oh no, I don't believe you have to turn from all of your sins to be saved but they're just saying that because they've heard it so many times. Oh, you gotta repent of your sins, repent of your sins. When you nail them down and start asking them questions and you'll find out oftentimes, sometimes at least, that their belief is like, no, no, actually, I mean, it's, it's just by grace. I put my faith in Christ and that's what got me saved. And, and oftentimes people don't even think about the words that they're using because they hear them repeated over and over again. So there's churches I'll say, oh, give your life to Jesus, give your life to Jesus, give your life to Jesus, and you'll be saved. Give your life to Jesus. And people start thinking, oh yeah, I gave my life to Jesus. When in fact, what they might have done already is just put their faith in Jesus and believed on him. But the reason why that's a false doctrine, Matthew 20, 28 says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and, gave, and to give his life a ransom for many. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. See, we don't give our life to Jesus Christ to be saved. It's the exact opposite. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for us. We don't give ourselves to God to get saved. He gave himself for us to be saved. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's the one who's done the giving. He's the one who's done the sacrifice. See, you giving yourself to God, it's like, see, I'm sacrificing myself up to God. I'm giving myself over to Him. No, that is not what gets you saved. You need to believe on the sacrifice that He made for you. There is no sacrifice that you can give unto God. Even if you say, hey, God, here I am, just use me. That is not a worthy sacrifice for your salvation. You already deserve hell. You need to receive the sacrifice that he made for you. Now, again, people get caught up in this because it sounds good preaching and people repeat it over and over again. And I understand there's people out there that, that use this type of phrase and use this terminology, but it's not really what they mean. But if you think about, that's why it's important. We need to think about the things that we say and not just repeat things that you've heard. Think about what it means when you say that. I gave my life to Jesus and that's why I'm saved. Oh, really? Because the Bible says that you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. It doesn't say give your life to Him. Now, again, is it a bad thing to, to you know, give your life to Jesus and, and to, to, to yield yourself for, for Him to use you in the way He sees fit? No, of course, it's a great thing to do. But that's not what gets you saved. No, it's not. There's a big difference there. It's the same thing with repenting of sins. Hey, there's nothing wrong. Hey, amen, repent of your sins. I preach, I'll preach it all the time. We should repent of our sins. But that's not what's going to get you saved. See, those are good things that we should do. But these are the things that gets preached in regards to salvation and it confuses people. And that's where people can start to, to doubt and to wonder, am I really saved? Because I've sinned or have I really given my life to Jesus? I don't know because I'm, I'm doing these other things that, that I want to do. I don't know if I've really given myself to Jesus. And this is where the confusion comes in. And this is where people start to doubt their salvations. And oftentimes people start to doubt their salvation because they didn't believe right to begin with. Now here's one of the things that actually applied to me in my personal life. There's, there's 
Um, you know, we're talking about reasons why people might doubt their salvation. And mine wasn't because of this false doctrine, these heresies that are being taught. Mine was because I had a lot of sin in my life. I got saved when I was 20 years old. I put my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. I called on God. And guess what? He saved me. Because that's what the Bible says He promised to do. Now, there are a lot of things that I like to do. I like the bottle. I like all kinds of other things. I, I, I prefer not to really go into detail on my sins. But I had a sinful life. We'll leave it at that. And after a couple years... You know, not going to church, not really doing much. You know, here and there, I'd pick up my Bible and read. I'd get this, this spiritual, you know, moment. And I'd be like, man, I want to get right with God. And then, and then it lasts for like a day. Or if I'm lucky, a few days. And then right back to doing what I'm doing. The flesh was winning in my life at that point when I was younger as a Christian. So I would think, well, if I really believe the Bible... If, I, if, if my faith is in Christ, I believe, because I do, cause, and, and I knew, I, I believe the Bible. If I really believe this, how can I say I believe the Bible, yet continue to do these things that I know are wrong? And that was a big problem for me. And that got me to the point to where I would start to doubt my salvation. And I'd, I would doubt it. The reason why I would doubt it is because I knew you know, salvation was by faith. It was by believing. But then I would start to question, how can I say I believe? Kind of like what James 2 is referring to. You know, you say you have faith. You know, if you don't have the works, your faith is dead. And my faith was dead because I didn't have any works. But it didn't make me unsaved. I still had eternal life. But my faith was not a living faith. I was not doing good things. And um, that's what got me to, to really start thinking, am I really saved? And I think this can affect a lot of people when you get backslidden, you know, you, you get into some sin, and you start thinking, man, you know, how can I claim to believe the Bible if I'm doing these things? Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter number 7. Because this, this kind of helps explain our sinful nature that we have, which is separate from our spiritual nature, as I was explaining a little earlier. We have a sinful nature and we have a spiritual nature. When you're saved, you have a new spirit. There's a new creature that's born again inside of you. You have a new spirit. But we have a battle to fight where we can choose. Are we going to walk in the spirit or are we going to walk in the flesh? These are the choices that we have to make. And if the flesh is winning out and we're just, we're just constantly kind of living in this, in this flesh and not really walking in that spirit, it's going to cause us to doubt. We're not going to have joy. We're not going to have peace. We're not going to have all of these things that come as a fruit of the Spirit. When you're walking in the Spirit, you have love. You have joy. You have peace. You're not going to be worried about your salvation. You know, you're going to have that peace of mind. You're going to feel the comfort of the Holy Ghost. But when you're walking in the flesh, you don't have those things. You're going to experience the fruit of the flesh. Romans chapter 7, let's start reading in verse 13. Romans 7, starting in verse 13, says... Was then that which is good made death unto me? He's talking about the law. God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. I remind you, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. Okay, in Romans 7, he says, I am carnal. You know, some people try to tell you there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Well, the Apostle Paul says, I am carnal, sold under sin. So you want to tell me that Paul wasn't a Christian? Because I think he was. Romans 7, verse 14. Look at, let's look at verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. What I would means what I want to do, right? For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, he's clarifying this, that in me and in his flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. He has that power of will. 
to choose. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. And he's trying to, you know, to, to explain this. I say, look, there's so many things I want to do. We want to do what's right. When you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Look, you want to do what's right. You want to live right. But somehow you find yourself not doing it. Somehow you find yourself doing these things you don't want to do. You find yourself getting in sin and say, look, I don't want to do this stuff. But you end up, you find yourself doing these things. Why is it? He says, now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. We have this sinful body, this sinful nature that leads us into this stuff and it draws us into sin. It doesn't absolve us. Because we do have a will. It doesn't absolve you from responsibility, but it, but it explains that there is this sinful nature side of us that is going to draw us away from the spirit and into sin. And we have the spirit nature that's going to try to draw us away from sin and closer to God. These things are going on right now in our bodies if you're saved. You have, you have both. And that's where he says... Um, in verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. You can still have that faith and you can still have your belief on Christ. You can still have that spirit and be saved, yet be walking in the flesh and doing these things because the flesh is drawing you, and we're, we're in this body of death. Now, one day we will receive a new body. We're going to be transformed. We are going to, our, our vile body is going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And we will get a new glorified body, which will not lead us into sin. It'll be a perfect body. But right now, hey, you get, if you're, anyone who gets saved, today, you know, at this moment, your flesh doesn't change. Everything, all the sins that you like to do prior to getting saved, your flesh is still going to like to do those things. It's still going to happen. Hey, it's, when I got saved when I was 20, I liked doing all those things before I got saved. And guess what? I, there was added a new spirit that wanted to do what's right. But I still had that old flesh. So yes, I did have a new creature inside of me. And that's when the Bible says all things have become new. Yeah, all things have become new for that creature, for that spirit that's inside of me. And that is whatever prompted me to want to read my Bible and ever want to go to church and do those things. But I still had this old flesh that was trying to, that was trying to draw me back into sin and trying to keep me there and under bondage. And that is why you can still be saved because you have that, that spirit and do, and do wrong and sin and do and do that which is not right as Paul explained here in Romans chapter 7 that I don't even want to do these things and I'm doing them and I would think to myself I know that this is wrong I know that getting drunk is a sin yet I still do it and and I'd get to points like I don't even want to do this anymore yet I still do it because you're brought into bondage of the sin now my soul was saved because my faith was in Christ but I was walking in the flesh and not in the spirit and see the the I wasn't exercising the spirit enough to get my spirit stronger than my flesh. And my flesh was winning that battle. So there's a battle going on. I think about a fight, a boxing match, right? I mean, if someone does no training and they're just eating junk food and they're not working out, not doing anything, and they go into that fight and the other guy, man, they're trained, they're pumped up, they've been lifting weights, they've been doing all the training necessary. Well, obviously that guy's gonna be a lot stronger and he's going to be beaten up on the other guy that didn't prepare himself and that didn't get ready and, and isn't ready to go. Hey, we need to exercise and get our, our spirit strengthened and, and motivated and moving and, and, and get it so that the spirit can overcome that flesh. Because when you get saved, especially that flesh, that flesh is strong. 
You got that's right. But I mean, God could help us and deliver us, but we need to we need to to really make sure that we're working that out and we're exercising that. And um, one of the last reasons why people can doubt there's there's plenty of reasons out there. The last one I have in my notes, we're running short on time. People doubt their salvation is because they're really not saved, because they're trusting in works. And those people ought to doubt their salvation because that will only help them. The worst thing you could do is have someone who is believing falsely and they, they still think they're saved. It's better to think that you're not saved to, to come to the truth than to just think you're secure when you're really not. And um, so we have, we have assurance of our salvation. And I'm going to go through some of these verses right now. Um, the Bible says in Titus 1, 2, you have to turn there in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. We have hope in eternal life. Eternal life means forever. And that's a promise that God gave to us before the world even began. God made this promise of eternal life. And we know that God can't lie. If you are trusting a man, if you're trusting a preacher, if you're trusting just any person, that person can lie to you. They can deceive you. They can trick you. But God can't lie. When God makes a promise, we can have that hope that, that we know. It's a knowing hope. It's, 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 it's a hope. It's, it's unseen, but we know that God is true and He's not a liar. We can have that, that assurance there. Turn if you would. Let's go back to Ephesians 1 where we started, where we, where we opened up and read. Because God preserves believers. Just like He's preserved His Word for us in 2014, and the reason why we believe that the King James Bible is without error is because God preserved it. If it was just left up to the devices of man, we would probably screw it up. There would probably be errors in here. There would be mistakes. But if God has preserved His Word the way that He promised to preserve His Word, that is why we can have it still available for us today without error, without contradiction. And we do. We have it today. The same way that God's able to preserve His Word, He's also able to preserve our souls. I'll read from you from 2 Corinthians 1, 21. The Bible says, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. See, God has sealed. When, when you get saved, God seals you. He puts a seal on you with the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. God gives you the Holy Spirit in your hearts and that earnest. If you think about anyone who's ever bought a house, well, you need to put down earnest money. That earnest money is something that shows, hey, I'm serious. I am going to buy this house. Here is this lump sum of money so you don't offer it to anyone else because I'm buying this house. This is my earnest money that I'm putting down. That means that I don't want to part with this money. So this is going to prove to you that I'm buying this house. You know, until we get all the details worked out, this is, this is what, I'm, what I'm purchasing. And that money is down. And you don't get that money back. If you're going to walk away from that money, that money is down. That money is already given, going to that person. When God seals us, He gives us the earnest of the Holy Spirit because He's bought us. That's just an earnest. That's like that, that down payment, so to speak. But we have that Holy Spirit showing that God's serious, that we belong to Him. And that He's going to redeem us. He's going to redeem our bodies um, in that day. But um, we're in Ephesians 1. We're going to see a little bit more of this sealing, God sealing us with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 13 it says, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. This is again, explaining the same exact thing that I just read for you in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, is that, after we believe, we put our faith in Christ, the gospel of our salvation, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's a promise from God of eternal life. We're sealed with that, with that Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance. See, when you get saved, you have an inheritance laid up for you in heaven. As, as becoming a child of God, God leaves you an inheritance of salvation, an inheritance in heaven. That, that where thieves don't break through or steal, where rust, rust and moth does not corrupt. 
It's, a, it's an inheritance in heaven. He says, until the redemption of the purchased possession. The purchased possession is our bodies. He's going to come back and He's going to redeem us. He's going to take our bodies. He's going to give us a new body, but He's going he's to change our current bodies into a new body. And he's going to redeem us and take us back and, and receive His purchased possession. He's purchased us through the blood of Jesus Christ. He sealed us. He set us forth. He says, you are mine. The moment you put your faith in Him, He seals us with that Holy Spirit. Hey, we can't break that seal. He's done it. No man can pluck us out of His hand. He sealed us until the day of redemption, and it's not going to be broken before that day. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says basically the same thing. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So he's saying, you know, the Holy Spirit has already sealed us under the day of redemption, so we shouldn't be grieving the Spirit of God. That's something we shouldn't do. We have the Spirit in us. We shouldn't grieve it, but we are sealed. We are sealed until the day of redemption. That's a fact. I'm going to blow through these real quick. John 6, 37. Um, we went over this again in previously in our, in our study on Acts. Acts 6, 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, verse 39 of John 6, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus Christ made a promise to raise you. He said, everyone that comes and believes, I will raise him up at the last day. Now I've heard, because I was doing a little bit of research, I was preparing another sermon as well for people who, who like to, to argue against once saved, always saved, which is what we believe here. But um, I was looking to see what people were saying about it, and they brought up this verse, and, and their argument against it is say, oh, well, this verse isn't saying that just because uh, that it's God's will. You know what I'm saying? Just because something's God's will doesn't mean it's going to happen. And in, those, in John 6, 40, it says, and this is the will of him that sent me. Right? And we know that. that you know, the Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, not everybody is going to get saved, but it's God's will that they should. But here's what they're missing about this verse, though, is that didn't Jesus do all of the work that God had for him? So with us, sure, we don't all get saved, but it's God's will that we would. But when God has a, the will for Jesus to do something, if it's God's will that Jesus do something, when Jesus does that, you know, Jesus was perfect. He didn't fail in any way, shape, or form of what God had for him to do. And his will was different. See, the contradiction with us is that we have a choice in the matter of us getting saved or not. We have, we have a, a, you know, the will to say, I put my faith in Christ or not. But once you do that, this is where Jesus Christ steps in. That's why he says that everyone would see at the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. So this is talking about those who already have believed. Jesus promises, I will raise him up at the last day. Once you've already done that, once you've already used your free will to, to, to put your faith on Jesus, now all of a sudden Jesus says, I will raise him up at the last day. If Jesus promises to do something, if he says, I will raise him up at the last day, and he gives no other condition to that statement, then you better believe that he's not a liar. John 17 verse 12 says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So Jesus fulfilled the will that God had given to him. Jesus makes a promise. It's just as sure as if God makes a promise. Last place we're going to turn, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. The last place we're turning will be done. First Peter chapter 1, let's look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Again, this is talking about that inheritance that we were sealed 
with the Holy Ghost. Uh, verse number five, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, the reason why we don't have to allow ourselves to doubt our salvation if we put our faith in Christ is because God has sealed us. God keeps us. God is the one who's responsible for making sure that we don't go to hell, to making sure that we are saved. And if God is the one that does that, if God puts a seal on us, if God's the one that keeps us, then we have no reason to doubt. We have no reason to fear that, that we may not, you know, we might not really be saved. If God's going to keep us, if God has sealed you with that Holy Spirit, when you put your faith on Christ, then, then you are sealed until the day of redemption. And there's nowhere in the Bible that says that that seal is going to be broken before that day. So hopefully, you know, if you ever, you know, hopefully no one in here will ever end up getting backslidden or, or getting away from God. But if you do, you know, one thing that we can be sure of is our salvation. One thing that we can be 100% confident in is, is, is the purity of God's word and the promises that he's made to us. And if you've received that gift of salvation, it's a promise. It's eternal life. It's going to last forever. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for, for your great gift of salvation. We thank you for, for truly doing all the work, Lord.